Tonight on SIP episode 121, Seller Angeles is joined by old friend Barry Waite, vintner at Tambor Bay Winery in Calistoga. Barry brings along his winemaker, Derek Flegel, and we are discussing all of the decisions they had to make to elevate their Pinot Noir program, including the one where they have to go outside of the nearby region of Napa and Sonoma to find Pinot Noir grapes from cool climate representation. Sit back, SIP episode 121 is here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SIP episode 121. I see Ivy for the first time in five weeks. Jeanette, good to see you. Jeff and Jane back in the saddle after a trip to not Galena, Illinois, but the Galapagos. Got that wrong two weeks ago. Sorry about that. Jim B., who might be fresh back from Cabo San Lucas, not Costa Rica. Julie F., Kent D., Lori, Mark, Michelle, Michelle M, talked to you earlier today. Ming, good to see you. Nick, Peter, uh, for those of you new, let's see show of hands. Who is new this evening? Okay, don't worry about that. Um, my name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels, a direct-to-consumer wine company that was designed and founded in 2010 to bring the best small production wineries direct to you from Napa and Sonoma. More often than not, the productions and wines that we feature on Cellar Angels for the last 13 years, you cannot get at a wine store or a restaurant. Uh, and we want to introduce to you the people behind the scenes. Before I get started, I want to honor a couple of folks who got the quiz question correct last week. The quiz question was, why are there roses planted at the end of vineyard rows? And the answer was B, to spot or give an early detection of disease. Now, we actually have two people on this evening that may confirm or refute that. So we'll address that in a second. But the first person to get this answer correct was Jim B. So Jim B is in the house tonight. So he will have 100 points placed in his loyalty account. MJ, if you are here uh, and you won two weeks ago, you have to have an account. So just go to sellerangels.com and create an account. It's not a Zoom account. It's a Seller Angels account. Uh, that is a good answer for that question. I do want to actually share with you some of the wines that people are drinking this evening. So when I say that we're a curator of some of the best limited production wines coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now, you have to go to the Cellar Angels website to see what I'm talking about. So when you get there, you will, of course, see a beautiful, picturesque introduction and immersion into what makes this valley great. Pretty pictures, amazing scenery, incredible wines. Uh, but you also can go to the shop wine and just click on shop wine and you will be navigated quickly to the current offers. The first offer you see is the sip kit designed to complement these episodes every Friday night. So this kit right now is going to be available for Fridays between February 24th and March 24th. Fun fact, March 24th is my birthday, so you should all be here with prizes and gifts. Uh, but that is not the only thing we have. You also have all sorts of wines that are coming up. You've got a J Cage, which is next week. They're gonna be in a two wine pack. So we're gonna be doing two wines that night. Elaine Wines, Papillone Wines, Elkhorn Peak is back in the saddle, Inspiration, Crux. These are some familiar names from the Sonoma side that you're going to want to participate in. But tonight, it's all about this Pinot Noir. So when you click on this bottle, the Tampa Bay Vineyards 2021 Pinot Noir Radian Vineyard, Santa Rita Hills AVA, Santa Barbara. Now, that's the first dead giveaway that this isn't Napa Sonoma. This is the Radian Vineyard behind me, and we're going to get into details about that. But this is an unbelievable wine. But Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, as we're going to talk about, is one of the most difficult grapes to grow. It is very finicky, doesn't like a lot of variation in temperature, doesn't like a lot of variation in heat, sunshine. It likes cool climate. And we've got two amazing people this evening to talk about the decision making process on if we're going to elevate our Pinot Noir program, because Tambor Bay had a Pinot Noir program beginning in 2012. What do we need to do? And let's start from scratch. And everything as it relates to Pinot Noir starts in the vineyard. So I am thrilled to bring on our tonight's guest, vintner proprietor, Barry Waite of Tambor Bay. And that's his winery right over here to my left. And then also winemaker, 
that first time on, so be good to him, Derek Flegel is going to be joining us for the first 30 minutes, and both of them have incredible stories, so I want to salute you both for taking some time this evening. Barry and Derek, thanks so much for joining us. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Barry's still on mute. Muted. We are muted now. I am unmuted. Okay. Good to be here, Martin. Awesome. All right. So the Tambor Bay Winery, you founded when, Barry? Founded it in 1999. Uh, born and raised in the Bay Area here uh, out of San Francisco. Uh, and what became a, a wine aficionado, so to speak, early in life, 1979. Um, I think a lot of wine people, winemakers, vintners, so forth, we all have our pivot wine. And mine was a 1974 Bullier Vineyards, George Latour. And uh, I stopped drinking swill at that point and started just drinking fine wines. But really through the 80s and 90s, uh, really got into wine um, almost professionally. Uh, but I had an alternative job at that point in corporate America. Um, I was to gonna ask I, what, I mean, <laughs> I, I have a question for you about the Bay Area too, because it kind of relates from a climate, you know, you've seen a lot mm -hmm. of things in the Bay Area from an evolution standpoint. So you founded the winery in 99 and your first wine epiphany was 79. What were you doing at the time that allowed you to kind of taste a Latour, a George the Third, and, you know, walk us through kind of that evolution process? Yeah, you thought, uh, Holy just, cow, there, yeah, there's quick, something quickly, going on here. Uh, Soon after uh, graduating from college is where I drank that wine, but soon after that, I got um, a job in technology. Um, I'm not a techie. I didn't uh, come back to the Bay Area to be a techie, but I was interested in computers. Um, I got a job with a, a fairly large organization, had a good training program, so forth. But uh, at a serendipitous event, which is also known as a party, uh, I, I, I met who is now known as one of the most famous entrepreneurs in the world, jo uh, Steve Jobs. And uh, from that point, uh, I worked at Apple uh, for 14 years. I worked within Steve's organization twice. Uh, once was the uh, development of the Macintosh uh, back in 1982 and 83 and 84. Uh, and then, of course, if you followed Steve's story, he left Apple in 85 and I hung on until 94. Wow. I uh, went to work for a couple other companies. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I'm very blessed to have fallen into some really cool places. And the next place I went to was with a small company that helped develop the, uh, the interface for a very struggling online company called America Online. And, uh, and, and by that development, uh, it just really hockey sticked AOL and uh, they took off to the moon. In 1999, um, I kind of ran out of kind of corporate enthusiasm. Um, I loved being an entrepreneur. Um, big companies are good to for America, but not me personally. So I really right. kind of drew back and I said, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? I apparently was asking that question a lot with a wine glass in my hand. <laughs> so um, decided to, uh, to get in the business. So I picked up all my toys and moved to Napa Valley and said, okay, what's next? Uh, became that, a grower. And that was 99? That was 99. And it was beginning of 99. So uh, beca I became a grower very quickly. And that, what you mean by that is I just bought some land. One had a vineyard on it. One didn't. And um, uh, I had contracts uh, to sell fruit to the likes of Behringer, Domaine Chandon, Franciscan. Uh, but about six months into it, being a grower wasn't satisfying enough because you don't do much. I mean, general, yeah, as a grower, you're a gentleman farmer. I'm not in there right. you know, putting my hands in the dirt. And so I wanted to make a little wine. And so um, uh, our founding winemaker is a gentleman by the name of Thomas Rivers Brown, a uh, pretty well-known guy right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, he helped me make 150 cases of wine in, 2000, in, in 19, no, when, uh, 2001, got to be specific. And that didn't last very long. So I doubled and went to 300. Then I doubled again, doubled again, doubled again, doubled again. And as you know, that got up there. And in 2007, um, became a true vintner uh, in the wine business here in Napa Valley. Tamra uh, Bay uh, started at 150 cases. We're now just shy of 10,000 cases. Uh, our primary mission is to uh, make, um, I like to use the word epic, but I'll just say uh, ultra, ultra premium style French varieties. We do concentrate on French. A lot of uh, Bordeaux. We're gonna talk about Burgundy tonight. 
Uh, we do a little bit out of what would be considered Loire Valley style and Provence Valley, uh, Provence area. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm able to exercise two things that I really enjoy. And I learned this back in my early tech days. Uh, one of which was I like working with people. Uh, I, I just really enjoy that. But the more important thing is I, I like being creative. And uh, my original job was a product marketing manager. And, you know, I get to create things and I have engineers on one side and I have customers and all that stuff on the other side. And I was in the middle guy and, and we got to create stuff and, and be market makers. And um, I got to tell you, the wine business is no better place for that role. Um, we're creative every year. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more today uh, about the creativity uh, of elevating a brand. How do we do that? How do you pivot uh, and change directions, but do so in an equitable way? And so I'm kind of in hog heaven. This is uh, the perfect job. And then, you know, look, it, I got a, I got a compliment. I get to work with people like Derek, uh, who are yeah, just and, spectacular. I wanted to bring Derek in in a second. And you mentioned, Barry, that you're blessed. And I, I you, we all are, quite honestly, just to be able to drink wine from this valley uh, but don't discount grit, hard work, perseverance, because you're one of the hardest working people I know in the Valley. Uh, you're continually on the road. And, and so talk about an individual that just gets it done and kicks ass and just is always on the go. It, it would be you. So, you know, um, who Gary Player said a long time ago, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And, and, and you certainly work your tail off. Yeah, you so, make opportunity and then you take advantage of it. So uh, and that is the hard work part. Totally agree. And Derek. You give us a little bit of your backstory, where you grew up, and then I'm going to follow up that question kind of related to Tampa Bay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of very few people that actually grew up in the town of Calistoga. Uh, so anybody that's been to Napa Valley, hopefully you've made it all the way up to the northern end, which is where we sit. Um, so, you know, it's a town of about 5,000 people. Um, my family was not in the wine industry, um, but I went to school with Mondavis and Trefethens and Phelps. And, and so, you know, um, my, my parents definitely had wine on the dinner table, but they weren't necessarily collectors. Um, so, it, you know, not, not realizing how special of a place I grew up in, um, I, I, I didn't really see a career in wine because I kind of felt like, well, my family isn't in wine, so therefore I will do something else. Um, but as time went on and, and I, I kind of began exploring other parts of the state, I went to school down in Southern California and then, you know, led to uh, some travels abroad. Um, I realized that I had this kind of gravitational pull towards wine in general and my what I considered to be common knowledge I started to realize was not so common you know to understand differences between all these different grapes and yeah we grow these grapes in Napa and we grow those grapes in Sonoma County um, but ultimately you know I, after graduating with a degree in biology um, I, I and I, I I played basketball, believe it or not, at a small Division three school. I, I originally was thinking I'd get into physical therapy or exercise science. I wanted to stay involved in in the sports industry, um, but in my mid twenties, I, I kind of took a leap of faith and and bought a one way ticket to Barcelona, and um, turns out that's a, a pretty cool place for a twenty four year old to hang out. Um, and I ended up living in Spain for four years, um, taught English. What prompted that? Most 21 year olds or 22 year olds still can't full, full disclosure. identify Barcelona on a map. Yeah, full disclosure, it was I wanted to go somewhere with great women, great food, and on the coast. <laughs> and it was like Italy or Spain. And I, I knew I wanted to go to Europe. Um, so it was Italy or Spain, and I'd taken a few years of high school Spanish, so I figured let's just go to Barcelona. Um, it was, it was a, a, a good decision. I don't, I don't, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into at that time. Thought I'd be there for maybe six months and, and found out that there, there's a whole big world out there outside of, you know, and it, it's, it's really fortunate to, to be able to come back to a place like Calistoga. You know, my mom still lives here. 
Um, I currently live here. And no matter where I went in the world, you drive up Highway 29 or the Silverado Trail at dawn or dusk, and, and it, it, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. So, um, yeah, I, I, I could, my travels took me far and wide, but happy to be back here. Um, so. so where were you when you realized that you might want to do something with Tambor Bay? Well, with Tambor Bay, I was so... I was previously working at a small little family run, you know, like 20 acre vineyard called Jericho Canyon. It's tiny. Uh, they really focus on um, Cab and Bordeaux varieties there in Calistoga as well. But I think at that point in my career, I was really looking for a challenge and I was looking for, for growth and I was looking for, um, you know, at, at, at a small facility, there's kind of a limit to the skill set that you can develop. Um, so when I was contacted about taking on the assistant winemaker at Tamber Bay, which was, you know, uh, Tamber Bay is still small in the grand scheme of things, but it was, it was a much bigger operation than I had been used to. So I was just looking forward to kind of proving, you know, that I could hang at a higher level, if, if that makes sense. Um, no, it's, it's it's a it's a great sports metaphor as well you're going to rise to the level of your competition and the opportunities around you so and love jericho canyon i mean those that hillside yeah. terracing is unbelievable um I, I have nothing but good things to say about the wines the people um and it yeah. also afforded me the opportunity to to sit down and blend with michelle roland uh heidi barrett was making the la serena and barrett and barrett and lamborn wines there at the time uh, Aaron Pott, who's another well-known consulting winemaker in Napa, was also consulting for Jericho Canyon. So, you know, after doing a harvest up at Outpost and meeting Thomas up there, and then next thing you know, I'm working alongside Michelle and Aaron and Heidi, you know, <laughs> as four of the kind of most influential uh, winemakers in Napa and, and with somebody like with Roland, he's arguably the most well-known and respected winemaker on a global scale. So yeah, it was, it was a great opportunity to, to learn from some of the best at a very early stage of my career. And, and you know, I, I, I take a lot from each of those people and, and there are different skill sets and different ideas. Um, but along the way, you kind of develop your own your own uh, philosophy on, on how to make wine. And um, so. Well, right. it's funny. I mean, you, you talk about Aaron. We, we know Aaron well, obviously. Uh, Michelle, in really kind of what you're highlighting is the wine community. And, and we talk about it at Cellar Angels all the time. Wine brings people together. It, well, good wine does. Uh, and, and, and this is certainly that. So I'm curious, and I want to talk about tonight's topic about Pinot Noir, because I'm drinking, as many of you are, the, the 2021 Radiant Vineyards. And you had a Pinot Noir program, Barry, and you started it in 2012. And now you made the decision to, to kick it up, not just one notch, but you know, a half dozen notches. And exactly. walk us through why would you do that with Pinot Noir? Because it is arguably one of the most challenging grapes to, to grow, produce, get in bottle and sell. But what, what was the catalyst, the pivot to decide to do that? Well, with the program that we started in 2012, I won't call it that we experimented with vineyards, but we certainly learned a lot about what it takes to make pinots and, and so forth. And so the pinots we made uh, were very reasonable. They scored well. They all scored in the 90s um, on the lower end of it, but still scored well. And uh, But there's always this undercurrent dialogue um, amongst... Um, our wine staff and some outsiders that said, you know, you might be able to do better. And uh, I'm always um, positively challenged by that term. And uh, so, uh, you know, Derek uh, came on board and uh, as, as winemaker, he was assistant winemaker for a couple of years. And then he came on winemaker in 2020. And uh, we had some challenges, both with 2020 we also had some challenges in 2019, not worth going into, uh, that allow us to really take a look at what we we're doing and strategically say, I think we can do better. How do we do that? And to my delight uh, in giving that challenge to Derek, 
Um, and, and by the way, one of the things I learned in corporate America is uh, when you have talented people, give, give direction and give rain to it. And that's exactly uh, how I feel that uh, Derek and I operated on. And I said, hey, I'd like to do this. Um, we'd like to, to be in the upper echelon of Pinot Noir making. I think it'll be great for the Tambor Bay brand to do so. Uh, we don't uh, have Tambor Bay Pinot fields per se, because uh, all my fields that I own are in Napa Valley. Napa's not good for Pinot. So we have to go elsewhere. But I said, you know, we also agreed, let's not limit it just to what we think is just the, the best is Sonoma. Let's go anywhere with that. And uh, boy, it didn't take but a couple of weeks for Derek's start turning up some real interesting projects. We, we call them projects. So uh, bear with me on that one. And, uh, you know, we can talk through them if we had more time, but a couple of them didn't work out, probably for good reasons, mostly for relationship reasons. But Derek brought three projects to the table, three different vineyards that are all outstanding. They're all very different, which is really important when you bring three products to the table. And uh, again, back to my product marketing days, it's all about differentiation. So how are these three different from each other? What is the story behind them? And then when you get into the wine business, what's the terroir, things of that nature. And uh, the last thing we had to really kind of deal with is Derek is convinced these will make epic wines for us. Is the relationship do we have with the growers? And uh, that's really important to me and us. We want to build longevity in relationships. Uh, we want it to be quid pro quo. That we're all working with each other because we have recommendations on how things get grown. You know, will they be adaptable to that? Things of that nature. And well, that's and how it came about. And, and we just got done talking about community and, and how certainly wine brings all of us together, but also within the wine community and, and people who have been longtime fans of Cellar Angels comment to us all the time. I've never even heard of this one. It's like, well, yeah, you're not going to hear of it because they made 240 cases and it's not going to be on a store shelf somewhere. <laughs> right. And oh, by the way, it's it's a side project of someone who knows someone and they have uh, three tons of extra fruit and they decided to make a cab from Oak Knoll or what have you. There is so much of that. And, and that I think is what makes the underpinnings of the wine industry so fantastic because the general public knows that the top uh retail side of things. But then when they start digging down, and this usually occurs after, you know, one, two, three, four trips to the valley, and they start realizing, holy cow, there's a whole world of wineries out here that I never knew existed. And Derek, it's actually your relationships that, that basically afforded the opportunity to find some of these projects that Barry's referencing. So walk us through specifically kind of what you were after and, and how you were able to identify some of these vineyard locations. Yeah. Um... So, you know, I, I think it starts with a having, you know, very, you know, ownership and as a more general term, kind of um, give giving giving you some some freedom to to go look for truly what what I wanted to make, which was the best Pinot Noir we could. So, you know, as as someone that that's lived here and and consumed a lot of Pinot Noir over the years, I I, I already had kind of a you know, a, a Rolodex of, of great vineyards. And then you, the next step is you start kind of, you know, asking around, you ask your other maker friends, you know, you ask people like Thomas, you, you ask people like one of our vineyard consultants, Nathan, you, you ask fellow winemaker friends if they know of any fruit available. Um, and then you start reaching out to growers and 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 picking their brain and seeing if they are willing to you know sell you some fruit and what they have available um but you know specifically with radian it, it was a little different in that that i had met matt dees who who runs the 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 hilt uh program down there he's the winemaker i had met him um years and years ago um back when i was still at jericho canyon and i would take yearly trips just traveling you know i'd stop in santa cruz and go to mount eden i'd go to ridge then i would go you know i'd, I'd kind of breeze through monterey and then i'd go to paso and then i'd go down and hang out down in lompoc which is kind yep. of where a lot of the santa barbara county wines are made uh, so i met matt a long time ago and, and there came a point where we had found 
UV Vineyard. So that was a new site for us in 21. We had found May Fee, which was another new site for us in 21. And we felt really good that those two vineyards were very different. And um, we were really looking for something that was truly cool climate. And now let me let me pause there for a second. Yeah, because we've talked a lot on the program about clones and uh, matching clones to vineyard specific the soil types, proximity to the ocean, microclimates, and things like that. So when you said you wanted specifically kind of a cool climate, Pinot Noir, what are you referencing? Yeah. And, you know, paint a picture for what that means to us. Sure. Um, well, I would say, you know, that a lot of Russian River is not that cool. And that's right. kind of reflected in, in the richness, the density, kind of the fruit profile is, is a little bit, uh, you know, it's riper. So Candied. with really cool climate wine, um, whether it's the, what, what people call the true Sonoma Coast or, or in, in this case, the Santa Rita Hills, um, a, a, a truly cool climate wine have a, a very uh, noticeable acidity. Um, the wines should be very fresh. Uh, aromatics tend to be a little bit more delicate. Um, so you might get uh, more floral aromatics. The fruit profile generally tends to be on the red side as opposed to, you know, our UV vineyard is it's like blueberry and, and there's a, a density and a darkness to the fruit profile of UV, whereas radiant is is like pomegranate and black raspberry and rhubarb. And so what I was looking for and what I mean by cool climate, it, it you know, the impact on the wine is they're wines that are more ethereal in a way. It doesn't mean that they can't have dent. It doesn't mean that they can't have texture or fruit. It doesn't mean they need to be thin and lean or austere. It just means that kind of that I think of wines more as shapes almost, you know, and, and it's mm. wine that it is not, it's a little bit more linear in terms of, you know, it's not, it's not muscular. It's not bulky. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's a wine. It, it's a prettier wine generally from cooler climates. Um, so that was the goal with, with bringing in Radian, we couldn't find, you know, there's not a lot of truly cool climate sites anymore in, in our neck of the woods. And, um, you know, we, we went out to Fort Ross Seaview and, and we were looking at stuff out there. That's truly cool climate. Um, but, you know, once we had established Mayfee and UV, we knew that, all right, we need something that really stands out. And, um, in this case, having already known Matt, having had lots of bottles from Radian, it was kind of like, man, that would be kind of fantastic to just be able to go work with that fruit. Um, and it turns out that, you know, he, he was, he was willing to, to, to sell us a couple of tons. And, um, so feel very lucky. That's super cool. And that was an awesome explanation of cool climate, both from a presentation standpoint, aromatically palate. So appreciate that. And I know, unfortunately, folks, we have to spring Derek because he's got a dinner. But before... Five more minutes. If, if you okay, would... well, good, because I've got two questions for you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, by the way, how old are you? That's not the question. That's a, that's a teaser question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how old are you? So it's a great year in both Bordeaux and, Bur both Bordeaux and Barolo. It's in the 80s. It's not 89 and it's not 86. So anybody that knows the great vintages of Bordeaux would know that it's 1982, 82. <laughs> 82, okay. So my question to you, having been born in 82 is what would you tell your 20 year old self that you now know? Mm. That, um, It will all make sense when you look at your life in reverse. Very interesting. The things that you are dealing with right now and in the coming years that do not make any sense and are very uh, challenging when you look back on your life, when you're 40, which I am, that, that then things will, will make a little bit more sense. Good answer. And I'm going to ask the audience a poll question, but we're going to let Derek answer it after everybody's done. 
So the first poll question is grammar. Which of these is the correct usage? The Pinot Noir variety is a challenge to grow. The Pinot Noir varietal is a challenge to grow. I don't have the answer because most of my English papers were A minus over D plus, which is the mechanics and grammar. Content was always good. And also Cecilia, hello to you. Doug and Lorraine, hello to you who have tasted Derek at Radian. Uh, wow. Dahlia, good to see you. Elaine is back. She's come back twice. Eric, thank you, sir, for the order today. Izzy, good to see you. All right, I'm gonna go five, four, two, one. All right, Derek, what do you have? And Barry, Professor Waite, I'm going to try it. I hope I'm right. I I'm, I'm feel pretty confident. Varietal generally refers to an actual wine and bottle. So a single varietal bottling of Pinot Noir makes sense. But when you're talking about different types of grapes, I would use the word variety. Barry? Uh, I'm just going to uh, relegate it to uh, Derek. He, he clearly has scratched this below me. It, it's funny, MJ, who is a, MJ, I think it's fair to say that you're a teacher of wine. And this is something that gets harped upon a lot. So if you want to put the correct answer in the chat, I am going to actually go with uh, the second one that had 17 people, but feel free uh, variety is a type of grape. Varietal is a characteristic of wine. Okay. So everyone got that partially correct. <laughs> That's so now the doing. second one. How many barrels of wine are made from one ton of grapes? Two and a half barrels, five barrels, 7.35 barrels, nine barrels, I was told there would be no math. <laughs> no smartphone use of people. This is the honor system. Ivy, I have to Google variety versus varietal every single time I need to use it in a sentence. Chat GPT. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Put us out All of right, job. five, four, three. Karen, hello to you. Kathleen, hello to you. Kent, I saw your question earlier. I will get to that. It is a good follow up. Nelson and Liz, good to see you. Sean is in the house. Two, one. Share results. Uh, Derek, correct answer. Two and a half. I Very always, good. Uh, Not even a hesitation. And look at people already ahead on the extra credit. I, How many tons per acre? I mean, that, that kind of varies by site, but I would say yeah. average, if you're talking about fine wine, is three to five. But then, you know, they're like Jericho Canyon struggled to get to two, you know, as a because it's an extreme site. Um, Radian, I don't think Radian gets three tons to an acre. I think they're they're probably in the the two tons an acre range just because it again it's a it's a it's an extreme site and you know what's the what's the expression uh, struggle struggling vines make great wines or some, something along those lines I mean there's something to that that if you restrict the amount of crop on a vine you're you're going to get a lot a lot more intense intensity of of flavor and aroma um with lower yielding sites generally speaking by, by the way uh, go ahead fred Fran fred franzia and we all know too about chuck their target is 17 to 20 tons per acre yeah <laughs> so it, the difference between production wines yeah and wines of property which i think we characterize ourselves at is that's one of the definite uh, definers right there well, and it's interesting, and Derek touched upon it because it does depend. You see some of these sites that are getting three to four to five tons per acre, and some, as you mentioned, are struggling based upon uh, slope to even get one and a half tons per acre. And, and out of it has to do with density of planting 
And my question to you, Barry, when you are looking at vineyard properties, do you factor that in from an economic spreadsheet standpoint that says, I, I can get X mm -hmm. tons for this per bottle, and you've kind of amortized it all the way out? You, you have to. It's a, it is an arithmetic formula, but it's got many variables. So it's not just the tons per acre, but it's, you know, what you can charge per bottle, uh, you know, at the end of the day. And uh, so, yeah, it is absolutely things we think about. Um, I have to tell you that when I first got to Napa and I was looking at my vineyards uh, to buy here uh, as, you know, pretty much a novice, I was told to use five tons an acre. Um, and then I found out kind of later, it's not very feasible nor is it practical if you want to make ultra premium wines. You're you're right. mostly going to go below five into the three to four category at best, just in general. And it's and Derek, I know we've got to spring you, so um, it's I'll salute you. I'm going to see you when we're out in Napa uh, later this summer. So congratulations on the position. Congratulations on these three vineyard properties and. Uh, and we are looking forward to more production and, and watching you pursue this vision. I appreciate it. Derek, that. was that your date that just went by? So this is for any of any Barolo and Barbaresco lovers, uh, which I am a fan of. Um, I'm, I'm about to go have a bottle of 2016 Gaia, which mm. is a big time Barbaresco producer that also happens to be the name of my cat. So I, I <laughs> take uh, I take Italian wines quite seriously. I was going to say, you take your Barolos very serious. Yeah, I do. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for spending Thank some time you. with us and, and chiming in. It's very helpful. It was a pleasure. Take care. All right. Cheers. Hope you enjoyed it. Right, Derek. See you yeah. later. So, Barry, one of the answers that, or something that Derek said resonated with me because of what you said earlier. And he said, it's very hard to find cool climate regions anymore. And when I was, you know, when you and I were talking at the beginning, and I said, you've seen some climate changes since you've been a lifer, if you will. Talk to us a little bit about how that impacts your decision making when you can't go to Fort Ross Seaview and, and maybe find what you want and, and how the decision making. I mean, you're going quite a bit of distance now down to um, Monterey, not Monterey, Santa, but Santa Barbara, Santa yeah. Barbara. Yeah. 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 Santa Rita Hills, uh, just north of Santa Barbara, you know, uh, there was a secondary reason of going down. I didn't want to interrupt Derek because of shortage of time. But one of the other things that we started strategizing on is to have more of a portfolio concept of where our wine is grown. Um, as many of everybody knows, Napa has uh, been subject to a couple of fires and we lost our entire 2020 red vintage uh, because of smoke. And so uh, the idea of having vineyards that are not in our area uh, becomes very appealing. So that really kind of opened up our eyes as, as well as the climate aspects of it, um, just on the aspect of the grape. So uh, we actually have another project that we've uh, started uh, in the Santa Maria area with a vineyard called uh, Bien Nacido. Now this is for a Chardonnay. It's, uh, we, we make a, a, a very French Burgundy style of that with a Napa vineyard. Uh, we're gonna do one out of there. We picked last year was our first year and pick on that. But so that's part of the strategy as well. And I think I think that's um, the, the great thing about Derek and I working together, and I feel really good, is he is he's obviously very thoughtful and um, you know wants to pursue excellence in the winemaking side. And um, I think what he appreciates, and I'm going to put words in his mouth, that he um, has a partner that's very business oriented and, and thinks a lot of those things through, which so many winemakers don't. I mean, you think about it, winemakers are scientists and artists. They're not business people. Right. They're not accountants and, and finance planners. Yeah. And, those sorts of things. and uh, you know, um, for another Zoom, uh, but a topic is more wineries are in failure right now than ever in history. Now, we've had a buildup of wineries over time. So we've had more wineries in, in, uh, than we've ever had. But the failure of them right now is 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 epic. And, wow. um, uh, and numbers, numbers of them. Um, so, so having a true business sense of, into it and, you know, the, the, the greatest joke that I hate is, you know, how do you make a million in the wine business? You know, you start with two and, right. uh, I hate it because you can do it. You can do well if you think of it from a business 
and strategy perspective. So anyway, well, and it's, throw that in. No, and it, it's, and we've said this for years, you know, making wine is easy, but there's also the selling portion. And that's the, but to your point about the economic and financial perspective and the forecasting and planning and budgeting and that sort of stuff that a lot of these folks that we see, they don't recognize that. Right. And, and that is a huge portion of it, which is why I think you're one of the hardest people working in wine and luck is the residue of hard work. And you certainly yeah. are proof of that. Um, but to get back, to get back on your, your original question is, um, you know, cooler climates are hard to get. Cooler climates um, help define wines of wonderful acidity and, and things of that nature. So it's kind of difficult uh, or it's becoming difficult to find that with the way the climate zones are going all over the world, much less here right. in Napa uh, and Sonoma. Um, now we're finding uh, other ways to combat that. There are things that we can do uh, in the vineyard and we're doing them very successfully uh, to help combat this so-called climate change. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, when you have a wine that is, and you pointed this out at the very beginning, that Pinot is such a difficult grape to deal with. I mean, it is the problem child of the wine world. <laughs> but if you can make a good Pinot, you're not only impressing customers, you're impressing your colleagues. And I remember when I was making my 12 and 13s with Thomas, um, he says, you know, when you get really good at this, this is who you're going to impress. And look at it at the end of the day, Look, I'd love to impress all my customers, but you know, it's my colleagues and my neighbors. When I get respect out of them for doing things, I mean, that feels pretty good. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting as they, I mean, you're in cab country, right? It's it's where legends have been made, and there's so many hundred point cabs in your region. They don't think of Napa per se as Sonoma or as a Pinot Noir country, so. You talked a no. second ago where you make a current Chardonnay in a Burgundian fashion, and you're kind of paying homage to that style. What does that mean to the layperson? What does Burgundian fashion mean? Well, if I could just give a reference point, you know, Mont Marseille, um, uh, this is a barrel fermented, barrel aged. So it has the, the Fomanti of uh, all the treatments that we, you know, we talk about when we make a Chardonnay but done so in such a well-balanced way that um, you, know, you can really appreciate still the Chardonnay grape. Um, you know, not to be told to anybody else, but I'm, uh, you know, my neighbors, I'm not a fan of California Chardonnays per se. And uh, I'm, I am jealous of a couple things of it though. I am jealous of the Rombauer business model. <laughs> I mean, they have been incredibly successful. But, it's just printing uh, money if, that, if that's the model you want. Right. You know, but you have Kendall Jackson, Sonoma Couture, all these characters have made a very distinct style, which has been defined as the California style, which is, you know, I don't think really shows the Chardonnay grape very well. So we make right. two different styles ourselves. We do uh, what we call an un -oak, without oak uh, version, which is very Chablis like. And then we do this white burgundy style, which is barrel fermented. We literally take the juice. We, it, the juice never sees a, a, a steel tank and goes right into barrel and is you know, fermented and then aged for 12 to 16 months. And so the wine has a wonderful richness to it, um, but it is uh, not overly oak. That's where we use the word balance. And has right. here's the exciting thing about these wines, the ageability of our French Burgundy uh, programs, white Burgundies is phenomenal. Um, and uh, I've been making a, a Chardonnay of this style now for uh, 21 years, 22 years. And uh, I still have a couple of the old ones left and we still haven't found the end of when that winds. All of it still, you know, shows length. So we think we're going to get 25, 30 years out of these Chardonnays. Um, and that's, that's a big difference from a California style Chardonnay that, that we know of. That's incredible. Jeff, do I have to turn your camera off? Um, <laughs> just making certain that you're behaving over there. Uh, Doug, good to see you. And I want to talk a little bit about these vineyards and show some people some things on how far away these are. So we're going to go right into Google Earth because it's going to be an extended version this evening. Uh, and how could you not want to have more Google Earth than we normally have? So for those of you that are new to Cellar Angels, uh, our playground that we know quite well is Napa and Sonoma. I'm going to let that catch up because the camera moves a little bit slower. 
Um, but from a standpoint of where we are in San Francisco, you, you have the peninsula, you've got Napa County, Sonoma County, and just an incredible influence of water everywhere. And you had, you know, 50 million years ago, a, a plate slam into this coast from another continent that pushes up all of these mountains into this region. It is one of the few areas that has this type of soil structure on the globe. And so regular angels know that this is a Mediterranean climate. There's only 3% of the world that has this climate. There's also, from a soil structure standpoint in these two counties, they have six of the 12 known soil types on the globe in these two counties. So to call this a, a you know unbelievable tapestry to be able to produce things from the ground up, it would be an understatement. This is where the magic happens in these two counties. And now Tambor Bay, as Derek pointed out, is actually in the far northern climes of Napa. So when you get past Calistoga, keep going, and, and, and then you're going to take a right-hand turn, and this is Barry's property for the winery right here. Uh, but you can see as we pan out that there's, there's some hills nearby, and it, it, it has some distinct weather patterns. And you've got St. Helena to my south, Calasoga to my south. But when we zoom in to the property, Barry, when you bought it, it was, if I'm not mistaken, a horse barn. What was it? Well, it, it was a horse ranch and it still is a horse ranch. Um, we do not grow any vines on this property. Uh, and it's if you look over to the right uh, a little bit, uh, you'll notice that there's a place called the Calistoga Geyser, is that where the blue is down below. And so we sit on a thermal pocket of what I'll just suggest is some pretty nasty water. <laughs> um, so we determine uh, that's best for growing grass <laughs> for the horses, and uh, and not for um, and not for grapes. Now the reason why we bought a horse ranch, uh, and Martin, for your audience, my wife and I have uh, been equestrians and at the professional level at certain times over our life, and we're still into it. Uh, I'll be riding a horse tomorrow, uh, right there in that big arena. So that's why we like the ranch. And uh, the last note there is the big gray roof that you see uh, is the winery. But when we bought the property, it was a covered riding arena. And uh, so it had a ceiling, but nothing else. So we uh, put walls on it, put a floor into it, put tanks in there and made it a, made it a winery. And in that winery, we make up to 35,000 cases. Martin, we haven't talked about Tamar Bay is just under 10,000 cases, but I make wine for uh, 20, 25 other wineries in there. Um, which wow. encompasses about 20, 25,000 cases. And, um, and I don't want to uh, sell Barry short when he says he's going to be on a horse tomorrow. Uh, he rides competitively endurance riding of distance of over, what, 160 miles just out of sheer boredom? Well, yeah, boy, well, it gets bored, but um, 100 miles in, in 24 hours. Those, uh, that's the requirement. And I usually do them in 10 to 12 hours. Yeah, so it's it's um, these are these are races. These are full on races. I'm not racing yes. tomorrow. I'm just going to be riding a horse. Leisure but, riding. Uh, that's that's been our sport. So now I'm going to show folks the UV vineyard. The UV Pinot Noir is what is in Barry's glass. So we're going to go over to Sonoma, and I just am stopping here to let folks know from a standpoint. We always talk about proximity to water and so from the uv vineyard standpoint you, you know you're 14 miles over a couple mountain ranges to the pacific my guess would be tremendous impact from from that vantage point of the cool breezes that come in and there's there's quite a few rivers there uh, especially the russian river but what was the and now i'm going to zoom in what was the draw here you know the draw here is a it's russian river uh, which is actually a fairly uh, large area. And so we're in the middle Huge of the area. Russian River. We're in the middle of the Russian River going uh, east-west. It goes uh, east quite a ways and it gets quite warm. Uh, but 14 miles from the ocean means it has pretty significant influence to that. But the real um, <laughs> the, the real influence of UV is what UV stands for. It stands for Ulysses Valdez. Uh, many of your uh, viewers probably know of a wine uh, grower here in Napa Valley called Beckstoffer. 
And uh, Andy's a good friend of mine. And we've gone to 49er games together and so forth. I haven't succumbed to buying any as fruit, but uh, you know, he's still a young man. I, I may get there. Um, but anyway, Ulysses Valdez is considered the best offer of Sonoma. Uh, he's the, and how we got there is he's a very good friend of Thomas Brown's. Now he manages yep. a number of vineyards throughout Sonoma, but this is his vineyard, hence the UV. Wow. And if you do any rating looks, you're going to find that uh, there's some wineries that make UV that have done very well. And another friend of ours here in Napa is a guy named Aubert. You might know that vineyard, uh, that winery. And uh, here's what ironically happened is we were chasing this vineyard. They gave us uh, some blocks. And uh, by the way, they don't, they don't make their own wine. It's all sold. Hmm. And uh, just weeks after we signed the contract, Wine Spectator came out with their top 100 wines of the world. And Aubert UV Vineyard Pinot Noir was number two. Jeez. And our block is right next to his block of fruit. So he makes about the same amount of wine we do, less than 200 cases right now of the UV. And so we're in really, really good company. And I think that's uh, probably intimidating for Derek. because <laughs> he's, right. he's got some... Uh, He's got some fellows out there that have been doing it for a while, but I'll tell you what, this, this uh, UV, uh, if I can, uh, you know, characterize it, this is going to be a Cabernet lover's Pinot. The richness in this wine, um, as I was describing earlier, just to, I'm looking at it right now. If I just look straight down uh, in my glass, I don't know if I can't see it. People can see how far it is this way. If I look straight into it, I can't see the bottom of the glass. It is so thick. Um, it has a thickness of skin that allows for a great intensity of extraction of uh, color. And uh, boy, if you have that, then you're going to have flavor. So the dark fruit in this, the plum, uh, the, the dark cherry is, is pretty pronounced in this particular wine. Um, 2021 was our first year with this one. We didn't, uh, Mother Nature was good in quality but kind of brutal on quantity. Uh, we missed our mark by about 40%. Uh, taking it out. So we only made 141 cases of this wine. Well, and I think um, it's, it's, I mean, you've driven these roads more than any of us. Uh, I've driven it quite a bit, but these are one of those country roads back here in Sonoma, where you're just looking at these beautiful vineyards and you have no idea. I wonder who makes wine there. And lo and behold, it's producing the number two Pinot Noir in the top 100 yeah, wines for spectators. There's, there's no sign. There's no nothing. Right. Uh, the Valdez family is a, a very introverted family in general. Um, but uh, it, we're, we're just very fortunate to be part of this. And uh, we, we hope to be there for a long time. I mean, this is pretty special to be in that vineyard. I'm going to take you to the Radian to give folks an idea of just how far south this is from where you are. <laughs> yeah. And there's uh, some economics involved in this because... You, you have to factor, we just got done talking about the spreadsheet analysis of, of wine production. And, and so now you're driving hours to go get grapes. Uh, five, and, five hours to be exact. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going 300 miles south. And you can see, folks, just how close this is also to the water. Uh, from a standpoint of the maritime influence and the Santa Rita Hills. Uh, in incredible. So Derek was the one that brought this vineyard spot to your attention. Had yeah, you he tasted had a... any, of, any of the Radian wines? I know, Doug, you have. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, Barry, if, if you had a chance to say, okay, what's so special about this? And how did that tasting occur? Well, it's, it's interesting. So Derek had a relationship with a winemaker and he spoke about it with Matt. And um, so there's two threads to talk about here. First of all, um, I, I, I did a quick background check and I was, I'm always been uh, fascinated with the wines of Santa Rita Hills. Uh, 15 years ago, I met the general manager and director of winemaking at Sea Smoke and uh, got the story of why Sea Smoke planted there really became the bellwether of Santa Rita Hills and certainly Pinot Noir. So I was, I'm a fan of the area for many, many, many years. 
And uh, so when Derek said, hey, what about these guys down at the, at the, at the Hilt, which is the winery? And then uh, in here, um, you know, my friend said, don't stop go go don't pass go i mean just right just go, go for it uh great and he, he said to this and he says but the interesting thing is when you get your background check and i said what do you mean by that and he says oh they're going to do a background check on you and the reason why that is is uh the owner of the hilt is also the owner of two other wineries one is called uh hunada uh which is a wine i've been following for years also uh down in the central coast but another one in Napa Valley, um, maybe you guys have heard of it. It's called uh, Screaming Eagle. Screaming Eagle? Yeah. Ah, I thought that was Sremin Agal. It's Screaming. Okay, I had the wrong. So the, owner, the owner of those vineyards is Stan Conkey. And Stan, of course, owns the LA Rams. He built uh, the, the stadium. He owns some Denver teams. He's a big uh, real estate guy, big real estate guy. And he's actually a big real estate guy in Napa. He's, he's Bill Harlan's right-hand man in building properties here. So um, I believe he is a significant owner of the Meadowood property, may have some influence in the reserve and so other things. Anyway, so anyway, going back to, yes, I'm going to get background checked uh, for this. So I did, passed it apparently. And um, so this is how we're into there. Now the Hilt is uh, Stan's uh, Pinot project, Pinot and Chardonnay. And so, but before we, we take any of these wines in, of course, we're we're drinking other properties that have made wine. So we have some context of what the fruit is, understanding that other winemakers are making them. This is right. pretty rugged ground. Um, I, it, it, I it wanted looks, to zoom in the show, folks, kind of, you know, we talk about a river runs through it all the time. And certainly there's a maritime influence of the river running right through here that's eroded this entire hillside away over the millennia. And then you've got the vineyards planted on the soil deposits that are left. So therein lies a lot of the magic. Yeah, and uh, it, it that seems flat in this picture. It is not. There's a nice hill. So, we, you know, we got the good drainage. You've got the great proximity of the ocean. So, uh, you know, Pinot is a grape that just loves sun but hates heat. Hates heat. And uh, so this is why the coast works really well. And, uh, you know, being off the coast a little bit, the fog line uh, doesn't come in this far very often. So it gets a lot of that good sun. Um, uh, it's a fantastic place. All right, Barry, I'm going to put you on the spot. Whoops. Let's talk a little bit of aromas, flavors, and pairings of the Radian as I pour my fourth glass. <laughs> kidding. Not kidding. Here, mission control. Um, so 2021 Radian, and, and I know you're, you're drinking a UV. Um, I don't have that density of purple that you have. I've got brilliant color, by the way. Uh, but I'm curious, give me some flavors aroma or aromas first. So we make, uh, I'll back this up. So we have, a we make three different Pinots and, um, they go from what I'll just say, light, medium, dark. Uh, UV is clearly, I've defined it as dark. Uh, Radiant is my medium. Uh, we have a, a vineyard called Mayfi uh, that uh, is about eight miles from UV, but completely different terroir. And that's kind of on the lighter side. But even at those light, medium, and darks, um, I'm, I'm still kind of beyond the center point with any of those that you would find for a lot of the light body, or I'm beyond the light body uh, Pinot. So these all have great density of flavors. So with the Radian, um, we're, we're dealing with a bit of blue fruit into this. Um, I don't know if I would characterize, uh, I'd, yeah, it's been a couple of days since I've had my last uh, go at it, you know, any plum nature into that. It's got excellent uh, tannic structure, you know, for a Pinot. Um, and we did not do any, which is different from what we did in our previous program. There's no whole cluster fermentation. So we didn't need any support uh, from the stems uh, to bring texture into the wine. Give me time out on the whole cluster fermentation. What would that entail? So it's a really interesting thing because it's a gut call by the winemaker at the very beginning. We pick the grapes, we bring it into the winery. And if the winemaker feels that there's not enough skin structure to bring tannin texture in, um, he'll actually ferment the wine or he or she 
will ferment the wine with some percentage of the fruit staying on the clusters. And what happens is actually extracting tannins out of the stems, not the fruit. Now, this hardly ever happens in the Cabernet world. So it's, it's really kind of a centric to the, the, the Pinot world to do this. And um, uh, we didn't do this with any of these wines. So the beauty is these are not whole cluster. It's, it's, it's not a deficient to do it. It's just a, a matter of process and it's a matter of preference. But, the, but there is none of that. So I feel we have sufficient structure into this wine. Um, and then uh, aromas. I, I love that description, by the way. One of the best descriptions of whole cluster pressing that I've heard ever. So um, you're going you're gonna to do something. You're going to go somewhere with this wine thing, Barry, just FYI. You think I should stay with it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have something here. Let me just... Uh, I'm actually looking for my notes that I, uh, my physical writing notes that I took when I um, did about three weeks ago. Hey, MJ, can you hang up the phone and uh, pay attention? This is some pretty good content here. You know, one of the things uh, I got out of this is uh, uh, obviously the red berries, um, more sitting in the uh, cherry, not so much plum, uh, but um, uh, kind of, kind of really dark cherry uh, onto this. Maybe, maybe a little blackberry. No prune. I wasn't getting the prune. On the floral side, uh, on the colors, uh, wonderful uh, lavender and a little uh, uh, on, on the colored flower side. Uh, little. So I'm drinking the UV, which is making me kind of lean in that direction. Because if I say that, you know, the UV, uh, I get a really nice swag of uh, tobacco. And I kind of, I wrote in my notes, black tea uh, for the radiant. So um, we have that. Um, you get you get nice uh, um, uh, maturation flavors that came out of the oak. Um, I like that. Some sandalwood is a note I wrote uh, for that. And again, I apologize. I'm, I'm reading notes as opposed to tasting. No, in front of you. that's okay. Mission uh, control senses a little cola. Very good. Excellent. Which is a, a, I think, a very good characteristic for Pinot, right? Yes. Uh, and then what is your, what's your go-to pairing, uh, top one or two, where you're like, this is a can't miss? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my go-to on almost any uh, uh, Pinot of structure, meaning it's not very light. It doesn't, it's not sitting in the strawberry, cranberry category. It's over here on the side that we like to not make them. Not the Jolly you know, Rancher category. Yeah, uh, certainly a duck. And mm -hmm. I'd like to have a good, you know, if you want to hit the home run, put a big uh, cherry sauce of style on that duck. Um, and, and if you really want to round it out, put some mushroom around it, things of that nature. Those, those are my go-tos uh, with this wine. Now, UV is so heavy. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to say this can border on, you know, light red meat, you know, not peppered, you know, you got to really stay away from um, doctoring it up, but uh, right. But that's the UV. But radiant, um, radiant sitting right in my in my middle. Um, God, get that nice uh, breast of uh, duck, properly done. Lots of juices, little cherry. We're we're done. No, I, I agree with you. I'm curious, uh, as I know some folks are going to be heading and traveling to wine country. How do they come taste at Tambor? We are uh, by appointment only. Uh, and by the so, way, just about everyone is by appointment only now, folks. So yeah. at least the wineries of stature. You, and by the way, that, that's that's not a preference necessarily. It is a county ordinance right. and, and part of our, you know, getting our permits. Uh, they require it. Um, any winery that has uh, been new since uh, the late 90s is by appointment only. And that's the county suggesting that. So. But anyway, it works. It works well. You have to do a little pre-planning. Um, but in, on our website, uh, you can go and make a reservation. You can certainly call us, but uh, you get to see your options. Um, and you 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 book a time here. Um, we have three different options criteria, kind of depending uh, from a cost perspective all the way to what you want to do. So um, those options will be presented to you when you get here. And uh, you can make those decisions as you go forward. Any of our tastings will encompass um, 
you know, there's five wines listed, but we always pour six to seven. Uh, and those six and seven are based on preferences of the people when they get here, uh, what they like, so forth and things like that. Most of our well, tastings and- also include a little bit of touring around and, uh, and also meeting a few of the ponies. Uh, some of yeah. the retired uh, long distance racehorses are, are right inside these stalls along the side. So behind me is our courtyard and that's where we do all our tastings. And uh, the horses are looking right in while you are uh, enjoying your your wine. So is uh, the is pretty that unique burglar, experience. Is that burglar horse still there that stole all the camera equipment out of the van when we were there filming? <laughs> Uh, I think so. I think okay. so. We haven't gotten rid of anybody. <laughs> no. Um, that is That was fantastic. All right. Now, Barry, here's your two questions. If you were not doing Tambor Bay, what would you be doing? Uh, what would I be doing? So I'm going to, um, as a good spokesman, I'm going to kind of pivot for a second. So I think about the answer. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, what would I be doing if not uh, this business? I can hum um, this property if that helps, or maybe. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a bit like Derek. We, you know, we both were athletes in college. I got to I got to play at the uh, very minor leagues of baseball, um, and you know, I'm still fairly athletic. Um, that's why I enjoy this horse sport, this extreme horse sport of riding fifty to one hundred miles in a race. Um, and so that that probably would have been my my deal. Um, I'm a little um, aged. I'm 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 a little <laughs> over experienced uh, still to compete at the levels that I was once competing. So I'd be coaching onto that. Um, so I enjoy that. Hey, you know the other thing, uh, Martin, that I did for a long time, and I still do to some respects, is I still coach entrepreneurs. Used to be in high tech, and now I coach uh, entrepreneurs in the wine business. And so I told you, we make wine for about 25 other wineries. And I kind of think of that as an incubator. And I am happy to say that four of the wineries that have come to Tambor Bay have graduated to where they make, they have their own facilities. They grew up, they're ready to to leave. Um, And so that's kind of our virtual IPO in in doing that. And so that's a, that's a lot of fun. And I, I love to work with people and, you know, capturing and manifesting their dreams in the wine business, which by the way, a lot of it is tapping them down because they think this is, as you kind of insinuated, people get into this business for, you know, some pretty altruistic reasons, but you know what? It's hard work. Yeah. You got to really, you know, it's just not making wine. You got to, you got to work it all the way through the business model and selling and things of that nature. Um, Okay. Second to last question. If you could have a glass of your wine, with anybody living or dead, what wine and who is the person? <laughs> uh, so one of my favorite actors in the world, and there's a documentary that just came out on his family that is fabulous, um, is Paul Newman. And, uh, you know, I can't see enough of his movies. Um, I thought he walked around with an aura of uh, elegant arrogance in most of what he did. And I understood it, it, what you see is what, what he was in Hollywood. Uh, so there, there's my guy. That'd be uh, actually pretty cool. Would you ever jump off a cliff with him if you, cliff with him yeah, if you no couldn't kidding. swim? Yeah, I'd ride a motorcycle with him. I think that'd be pretty neat. Um, so still one of the, one of the greatest Hollywood lines ever. What do you mean? You can't swim. The fall's probably going to kill you. (laughs) I love it. it. Um, All right. A a question from the audience is the Rabicano. Talk to us about that. Rabicano is a Bordeaux blend. Michelle, Michelle, you are showing it there. We've been making that since 2007. That was a project that started with Thomas Brown back in 2002, when I had 17 acres of some, dig this, I had 17 acres of Pinot Noir in Napa, in the middle of Napa Valley, but we were selling that fruit to Domaine Chandon for champagne. So be honest with you, they don't really care about the quality of the wine when you're making a 15 to $25 champagne. They really don't. And and 150,000 cases of it. Yeah. And uh, 
So I, I quickly realized I'm not in the business to make shitty wine for anybody. So we tore that field up and said, what do we want to do? And we planted uh, four, then later five different Bordeaux varietals. And we called that field, that, four, that 17 acres, still do today, we call it the sandbox. And we hmm. called it the sandbox because it is our play field. How, how, we're going to determine what we're going to do. So Martin, back to some of your pretty comments, we planted four different clones of Cabernet, three different clones of Merlot, uh, and also Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot, and then later on Malbec. And be, it, we just make a whole bunch of wines out of that. And, and the first wine we made was uh, Rabicano. Uh, 110, 120 cases back in 2007. We've kind of perfected the model of Rabicano, that it is a Cabernet-based Bordeaux blend with a really good punch of Merlot. And so what does that give mm. you? You have that Cabernet base of black fruit, you know, that cassis, that wonderful thing. It tastes like a Cabernet, but there's a lot more going on. The softness of that wine comes from the Merlot, yep. right? So there's always about 20 plus or minus percent that really kind of tames, taps down that the tannic structure. And then we spice it up with Petit Verdot and um, uh, Petit Verdot, what else? Cabernet Franc. And about four years ago, we started integrating Malbec into it. Malbec's tricky. Malbec um, is, is a heavy spice. And it's uh, to me, it's like truffle. You put just a little bit too much truffle in something, the only thing you taste is truffle. Got to be really careful with Malbec. Um, Technically not a bad thing, by the way, too much truffle. Oh, no, no, no. But, but you know, you put that 2% of Malbec in and there's a juiciness to it that really comes to light. So depending on the vintage, it seems like we're doing it every other year now of that. But Rabicano has also inspired three other uh, bottles that we make that are all uh, blends, but they all have the kind of different focuses. But one of the things is they go by really funky names, which are all like Rabicano. It's Tavero, Sabino, and Vermejo. And these are all horse-related terms, including Rabicano. So mm -hmm. we kind of keep our horse theme running through, you know, our brand. The brand Tambor Bay is named after my first two Arabian horses. And so uh, we kind of have fun with that. But uh, we, we make these very serious wines. Um, no, the, the wines are incredible and, uh, we can't thank you enough. And I know we've kept you long past the time. So, um, cheers to you for explaining everything about what we've just talked about and going deep on some of these topics. Cause I think it's really fascinating to learn a little bit about more about not only Tambor Bay, but the philosophy behind elevating the Pinot Noir program. And then some of the early wines and the decisions you made, uh, I will certainly drink to that. Hey, just one last note uh, back to Derek. Uh, Derek is a sincere partner and I've met my business partner of life with him. And he talked about Jericho Canyon. Um, you know, I'll let you be the first to know that we will be releasing a year from now, a Jericho Canyon Cabernet Sauvignon. Whoa. So he was able to convince the owners to give us uh, seven rows of his favorite block out of all their vineyards. So wow. uh, small production, and but Cabernet. So it gets back to the whole notion of relationships and, you know, the community here and helping each other out. And uh, Derek's just doing such a fantastic job for us. I can't, uh, can't, I can't. That's stop awesome. Talking about it. And so, it's funny anyway. because it, it brings it full circle. Uh, we talk a lot on this program about heroes and, and the world certainly is in need of a lot more heroes. And we have gone zero days without a mass killing in the United States. And I would like to at least go one now and then. And it's interesting that heroes, that if you go back to Plato's Academy, these folks were revered, and we talk about it a lot on the program. Uh, the hero is the defender and protector. They, they, didn't, they weren't murderer of bad guys or anything like that. The heroes defended and protected, and that's what the cellar angels are. They are protectors of the limited production winery. Uh, I will blow your mind with one statistic. Author, blogger, and Harvard grad Ali Benazir calculated the odds of any one of us actually ever occurring into existence. It's literally mind-boggling. You are a one in 10 to the 2.6 millionth power of occurring. Now, to put that in context that's even more mind-bending, that's like giving 2 million people a dice, a die, and that die has numbered one through one trillion on it. Not one through six, but one through one trillion. And all two million people throw the die and it lands on the same number. 
So that is the odds of all of us actually existing. So with that type of staggering, insurmountable belief that we're all here, who cares about the person that's cutting us off in traffic? Let's all come together, love one another a little bit more, be heroes and protect these folks that are producing some amazing wines because we can't do this without all of you. So Barry, thank you so much, sir. I can't wait to see you. All you angels out there, be good to one another. And we'll see you next week with Jay Cage Sellers because they decided to actually start a winery in their 50s. Barry, they probably should have consulted with you. I don't know if that's a wise <laughs> career move. I'll learn something from them. Hey, thank you, everybody. Martin, Denise, thank you. Love you both. All right, cheers. Be good. Cheers, everybody.